Uh, I am Norman Davies, a fellow of the British Academy and Professor Emeritus, both of uh, CCUCL in London uh, and of the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Unfortunately, I've not had the pleasure of a haircut for more than a year. By writing a biography of a British monarch, I'm straying a bit from uh, my usual territory. I've spent most of the last 50 years writing about continental Europe and Central and Eastern Europe in particular. I've written the Oxford History of Europe, published as Europe a History in 1996, and several books on the history of Poland uh, and other things. I only received the commission from Penguin Books uh, to write this biography of George II because none of the leading British historians were specially interested. For George II, or George Augustus, as I prefer to call him, has been regarded until recently as one of the least attractive and most unpopular monarchs in the series. Until a distinguished Cambridge historian, Andrew Thompson, wrote a solid biography about him some 10 years ago, he was largely neglected and often needlessly vilified. This treatment, I think, is very unfair. For George, or George II Augustus, as I prefer to call him, ruled and reigned for 33 years in an important period when his German dynasty, the Guelphs, had captured a glittering prize in the rising kingdoms of Great Britain and Ireland, and when Britain's own naval power and Britain's slave trade were reaching their peak. In other words, there is quite a lot to talk about. In this brief talk, I intend to present five salient points about the man and his reign. Firstly, George II Augustus was the sovereign ruler, not just of Great Britain, but of two complex political entities and their several dependencies. That is, Great Britain and Ireland, and a substantial cluster of possessions in Germany, stretching from the Elbe to the Harz Mountains from the border of the Netherlands to Saxony and Brandenburg in the East. This was not, as one leading British historian has put it, a dinky little principality. Secondly, the idea of the composite state has been with us for 40 years or more. Uh, it was, um, developed uh, in, by British historians, uh, by Professor Koenigsberger and uh, John Elliott, among others, uh, more than 40 years ago, and yet has not been applied uh, systematically to British history. Uh, and yet, uh, in my view, it seems to be a, a peculiarly apposite uh, to the, uh, the reigns of the early Georgians. Uh, George Augustus too, I think, has an important place in the history of the British Parliament, where it is wrong, in my view, to think in terms of a linear, linear progression from the uh, the, um, from the glorious revolution of 1688 uh, to, uh, to the Regency uh, at the end of, uh, of, the, century, of the 18th century. Um, in 1714, 
when the House of Hanover, as we call it, um, came to the British throne, uh, George Augustus's father, we know as George I, declared that he was not inheriting, not succeeding by the will of Parliament, but by the right of his uh, uh, inheritance, the inheritance of the Stuarts. Uh, the English Parliament had, uh, had used this explanation for their choice of a candidate to the throne, and it was used uh, by the incoming dynasty pretty ruthlessly. Uh, and it's, it seems to me uh, that uh, in the uh, first part of the 18th century, uh, the supremacy of Parliament as um, declared in 1688, it was greatly diminished. Uh, and the, um, the Georgians uh, ruled uh, in a sort of hybrid style. Uh, in their German possessions, they had no parliament at all to contend with. Uh, in the British parliament, they uh, followed laws closely uh, however, which did not apply to all parts of their uh, dominions. Fourthly, um, the achievements of George Augustus are more considerable than usually granted. Uh, in his eyes, of course, holding the composite state together uh, from beginning to end with one small uh, interval uh, uh, during the uh, Seven Years' War, um, was, that was his greatest achievement. In British eyes, of course, uh, the rise of naval power and of empire, uh, as um, achieved by the end of his reign in 1760, uh, was a, a towering achievement which um, uh, almost all British history books acknowledge but never seem to uh, attribute in any way uh, to the reigning monarch. Um, but apart from that, uh, uh, George Augustus was not quite the slouch that um, historians have suggested. Uh, for example, he is often said that he was a sort of boorish Philistine who had no time for um, poetry or literature uh, or, or learning. In fact, he was the founder of three universities, three universities, uh, not universities in England, uh, but uh, one in Germany, Göttingen, and of course, uh, Columbia in New York and Princeton. Uh, this was no um, minor matter, and yet uh, it is very rarely attributed uh, to the, um, the enlightenment of the monarch. Uh, fifthly, and this I think is uh, very important, in order to describe the, the reign as it deserves, I believe it is necessary to diverge from the conventional terminology the, the conventional Anglo-centric terminology and to assist on uh, more realistic terms. Uh, I've said that, that I prefer to call um, the monarch uh, George Augustus rather than George II. George II was his British title, uh, but that's what he, not what he was known as uh, outside Britain. The dynasty, which we are told um, uh, was the Hanoverians, uh, was in fact, their, their native name was the, the von Welf, the Guelphs, uh, and the, the Hanoverian title was invented, I think, to pull the, uh, the wool over uh, English eyes as to who the, exactly they were importing. Uh, the name of the electorate. It's usually uh, described as electorate of Hanover. Well, that is rather anachronistic. Um, the name of the electorate was the uh, electorate of Braunschweig, Luneberg, Kallenberg. Uh, and if you use that term, of course, it gives a very different flavor 
uh, to the uh, already domesticated term of Hanoverians. Uh, the coat of arms as well is universally called the Royal Coat of Arms. And yet uh, if you look at this monarch's coat of arms, it has the crown of the Holy Roman Empire in one of its quarters. Uh, it is not the royal coat of arms, it is the royal and electoral coat of arms, uh, as uh, the courtiers of the time would have call, called it. And again, the court itself, British hist history books assume that this is the British court. In fact, it was a court uh, of both uh, his British uh, subjects and his German subjects and ministers, many of whom lived in London and ruled uh, over the electorate from London. Uh, very few people tell you, for example, that the Prime Minister of Hanover lived in Downing Street until 1732, not the Prime Minister of Great Britain. And there we go again. Do we call, uh, talk about the King electors Prime Minister Walpole to begin with, or do we call, talk about the Prime Ministers, plural, because he had two of them? Uh, and so I could go on. Uh, I have to stop. If you want to hear more about the slave trade and other important things, then please find the book when it's published shortly and enjoy it. Thank you very much.